This is Movie Tone. Lionel Gamlin reporting. Mr. John Clare, Registrar of Westminster South, played his official part in the Royal Christening early on the historic day. He is seen here at Caxton Hall after his visit to Buckingham Palace to register the royal baby. The records of the birth follow the customary procedure. Here are the details and signatures concerning Prince Charles of Edinburgh. In the afternoon, there was quite a crowd at the palace. Though the ceremony was to be a private affair, there was a chance of seeing some of the 50 people attending. The Archbishop of Canterbury, of course, was one of them. Only a fleeting glimpse could be obtained of other arrivals, members of the royal family and sponsors of the baby. Londoners at the palace gates were on tiptoe to see them all drive in. As ever, there was a special, heartfelt ovation for Queen Mary. The christening was to take place in the music room, and, as I've already said, it was private. But filming was allowed in the palace before and after the ceremony. Dr Fisher, wearing cope and mitre, posed with his assisting clergy. Here is the first picture of His Royal Highness Prince Charles of Edinburgh, second in the line of succession just four weeks old. Those present included Lady Braben, the baby's first cousin once removed, next to Prince Philip and the King, then Mr. David Bowes Lyon, the Queen's brother, and the Earl of Athlone, the Dowager Marchioness of Milford Haven, Princess Elizabeth with her little son, Queen Mary and Princess Margaret. Queen Mary with her great-grandson. The fact that the King was well enough to attend the ceremony was very good news indeed. In addition, everyone will share his natural delight in this happy family occasion. For the Queen too, it must have been a day of the greatest happiness. Naturally, many groups were taken. They will be treasured in the royal family album, as indeed they will be remembered by all of us. Four generations, as this one may be called, is one of the most memorable. For Prince Charles's father and mother, it was a day of pride as well as joy. Incidentally, it's reported that the baby prince behaved with exemplary fortitude throughout the christening. As the pictures clearly show, he paid no heed to the filming, remaining perfectly calm while the cameras produced the records we've all been so anxious to see. And when the filming was over, along came Nurse Rowe to put His Royal Highness to bed. The scene is Windlesham Moor country home of Princess Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh. Prince Charles is now eight months old, and his father and mother have responded to the often expressed desire of the public to see him. They allowed the British Newsreel Association cameraman attached to the royal family, Graham Thompson, to take these delightful pictures. The young man sits up very straight in his pram, but he's rather distracted or mystified by the camera. Oh, it's the camera he's looking at, not you or me. At eight months, you notice things, and a camera is something different. But presently, he notices his mother again, and the recognition makes a charming study of happiness and parental pride. Now the Duke of Edinburgh takes a fatherly hand. 
his technique being no better and no worse than most fathers. A slight remonstrance from Princess Elizabeth, but not, I think, a real protest. Even when they're seated safely on the rug, Prince Charles still seems fascinated by that camera. Ah, this rubber duck must certainly be something to go in the mouth. A present from Queen Mary, by the way. A little teething trouble just now, I'm afraid. So the duck is doubly helpful. Whom do you think he's like? The usual family question, undoubtedly discussed in the royal family. Well, to me, he's the spitten image of his father. But the lady over there in the theatre has just said he looks like his great-grandmother. Oh, bless you. And, of course, there's a resemblance to Princess Elizabeth. But it's only right and just for a son to favour his father, surely. From seven months onwards, baby should be able to control his hands and grasp objects securely. Or so it says in the baby book I consulted. They may be the most priceless pearls in the world, but they're only a string of beads to me. Has he begun to try and speak? Well, that I can't tell you, but I can say it won't be long now. In his pen, he'll first learn to crawl and presently to take a few steps. But don't demand too much of him all at once. It's enough that he and his mother and father have made a charming picture for us. A picture of family happiness which some may envy, but none will grudge. occasion with the eldest children home from school, father back from his travels and the family together again to celebrate mother's birthday. Sturdy and independent Prince Andrew, four years old. Her Majesty, now 39, spending a quiet holiday at Windsor. Like any mother, she finds that a growing baby can be a real handful. The youngest member of the family, Prince Edward, is now a year old. Princess Anne is 15, Prince Charles 17. Frogmore House, with its magnificent gardens where these pictures were taken, has links with the royal family going back to Elizabeth I. Prince Philip looks exceptionally well after his recent overseas tour. Even a royal baby can get tired of posing for the cameras and Prince Edward makes it clear that he's had enough. Prince Philip plays the proud father as the royal family walk back to the house. Movieton joins the nation in wishing Her Majesty many, many equally happy returns of the day.
Wales, topographically mostly mountainous, great hills which sometimes even disconcert the Welsh. The red dragon, a dragon passant ghoul on a green and white field. And underneath the green, black gold. Population less than three million, but a distinct nationality with a language, a literature and a style of its own. The memory of Llewellyn ap Griffith, last of the great Welsh princes. Killed by the English in 1282, he remains for some a martyr. Latter-day Llewellyns sleep easier in these non-conformist, net-curtained terraces. But even here, respectability masks the fires of nationalism. Great believers, the Welsh, are never happier than when expressing their faith in song. Strong men, strong memories, strong thirsts. And whatever the nationalists might claim, not all Welsh water finds its way to English households. Fly-casting grocers studiously ignoring all others. And everywhere that magnificence which demands humility. Monolithic landscape, birthplace of heroes. Besides the best mutton in the world, it breeds that special sort of patriotism and distinction that the Welsh once fought so hard to preserve. But Llewellyn had to die. The ancient kingdoms of Gwynedd, Powys and Dehaibarth give way to other battlefields. Plyeth Cymru might disagree, but today Wales is united within one kingdom, where the balance of payments is a louder, if less heroic, battle cry. Today's red dragon breathes red fire through teeth of steel. And it all started, this unity of purpose, over six and a half centuries ago, when Edward I said at Carnarvon, I give to you a prince. Charles Philip Arthur George, the 21st Prince of Wales, drives through the streets of ancient Carnarvon for his investiture. Not really a tyrant, as some extremists claim, but a descendant of the blood of the ancient Welsh dynasties, even of the great Llewellyn. The prince's own standard for use in Wales. Flanked by the banners of Llewellyn ap Griffith and the Red Dragon, the prince's procession winds through the wards of the castle. As Prince Charles enters the Chamberlain Tower to prepare for his part, the Queen demands admission at the gate. Lord Snowden, Constable of Carnarvon Castle, offers the key, and the Queen returns it to his care. centuries old form a somber frame for the glowing pageantry within. As the final actors move towards their places, the colour is complete. At the bidding of his queen, the bareheaded prince comes forward. The letters patent addressed to all lords, spiritual and temporal, and all other are subjects whatsoever, are read in Welsh, and the prince is invested with the name, style, title, dignity and honour of Prince of Wales and Earl of Chester.
the sword of his earldom. The coronet for sovereignty. unity between prince and principality. The rod for temporal rule. And a cloak of ermine. I, Charles, Prince of Wales, do become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship. And faith and truth I will bear unto thee to live and die against all manner of folks. The acts of investiture, homage and fealty are complete. Now the queen takes her son to present him to his people. And what does this all mean? Is it just an out-of-date, meaningless formality? Or has something important happened here? The answer must lie in the hearts of the Prince and the people of Wales. Still at Carnarvon, it has been an impressive and a moving day. I feel that uh, it is a very impressive ceremony. Um, I know perhaps some people would think that uh, it is rather anachronistic and out of place in, uh, in this world, which is perhaps uh, somewhat cynical. But um, I think it, it can mean quite a lot if, if one goes about it in the right way. I think it can uh, have some form of symbolism. Um, it, it, for me, it, it, it's a, a way of um, officially dedicating one's life or, or part of one's life to Wales. And, uh, the Welsh people, after all, wanted it. And uh, I think also that uh, the British, on the whole, tend to do these sort of ceremonies rather well. And uh, for this reason, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's w done well, in fact. And uh, I, I think it's been very impressive, and I, I hope uh, other people thought so as well. exactly 52 years ago since the last Prince of Wales took his seat in the House of Lords. Today, Prince Charles talks with the Duke of Kent, one of his sponsors, just before his own historic introduction.
already in the gallery, Princess Anne with Princess Margaret and Princess Alexandra were waiting to watch the colourful ceremony. Here, assembled to usher in the young prince, resplendent in their robes of office, were the Lord Steward, the Lord Chamberlain, the Earl Marshal, the Lord Privy Seal, and the Lord Great Chamberlain. The procession is led by Garter King of Arms, bearing the patent of creation. Prince Charles follows between the Duke of Kent and his other sponsor, the Duke of Beaufort. His martial coronet was carried by an equerry in Royal Air Force uniform. After the inauguration, Prince Charles returned to the house in a lounge suit to listen to a debate on youth. It is a very great privilege for me, both officially and personally, to welcome our guest today. And as I looked over the historical record of the visits of the Prince of Wales to this house and to this nation, I find that they take place about once every 50 years. The first in 1860, the next one in 1919, and now in 1970 on this occasion. And the fact that this visit is a personal visit and not an official visit is an indication of the closeness of the relationship between uh, the United States and Great Britain and the British Commonwealth, and also between the family in this house and the family in London. I would like to say to our royal guests today that we want you to feel very much at home in your brief stay. We want you to get to know our capital, uh, our Congress, our baseball team, we hope it does better than it's been doing recently when you're here. And also, we hope you know and get to know our young people, the young people in our family and the young people you will meet at the occasions that you will be attending here uh, and on your brief stay. President, thank you very much indeed for all your kind words and welcome. My sister and I have been uh, looking forward very much to this particular visit since you came to London not very long ago and we're very touched that you should have decided to have us in the middle of what must be a very busy summer with all the work that goes on in a, in a capital like this. We've been looking forward to it enormously because America to me and to my sister has always been a very fascinating and intriguing country and we've always longed to come and we're particularly grateful to you to let us stay in the White House. And little did we expect that the first and the only house we would stay in on our first visit would be the White House. It's a peculiar honor, I think. And we're also very grateful to you for letting us see all the various things of interest in Washington, which we shall see when we're here. And uh, we look forward to seeing the, the Capitol and the various monuments. And one day, particularly, we hope to come back and see much more of this country, which inevitably, in any of the few days that are left to us here, we can't see very much. Thank you very much indeed. We look forward to it.
at the Britannia Royal Naval College, the start of a new training course for Prince Charles, who arrived wearing the uniform of an acting sub-lieutenant. The college staff were present to greet the new student, and the naval cadets put on a parade in his honour. After talking with Admiral Sir Horace Law, Commander-in-Chief Naval Home Command, Prince Charles entered the college building to be shown around. Part of the Prince's six-week study course will be spent in this electronics laboratory. There's also a language laboratory, fully equipped with the most modern teaching devices. Later, as a watchkeeping officer aboard HMS Norfolk, Prince Charles will put the navigation theory he learns here into practice. Other subjects included in the course are administration, management and sea operations. During the course, Prince Charles will rise at 6am and spend a full day studying with his classmates until pipe down at 10.30pm. It promises to be a busy six weeks for the new Royal Naval Officer. Prince Charles getting some last minute instruction before his parachute jump over the channel. This film taken at Abington Parachute School and film of the actual jump was taken especially for official Ministry of Defence records. A few words of cheer from senior officers and the Prince boards an Andover transport of 46 squadron. His jump certainly wasn't compulsory but it's a normal part of the course for his fellow cadets at the RAF College Cranwell and the Prince insisted on making it. And there he goes from about 1200 feet. A safe but rather soggy landing and in no time the Royal Marines are there to pull him out. His verdict? A great thrill, but apparently the water was colder than he expected. So the Prince, having changed into blazer and slacks, headed for the traditional glass of red wine. HMS Heron, headquarters of Naval Air Command at Yeovilton, Somerset. It's also the base for a special wing of 707 helicopter squadron, newly formed to train a special pupil. Naval Lieutenant Prince Charles is taking to the air again, this time in a helicopter. He's already qualified as a jet pilot with the RAF. As Prince of Wales, he wears the Red Dragon of Wales. 12 members of the training unit will wear scarlet and gold arm flashes depicting the dragon until the prince completes the course. The course is strictly operational including 53 hours of ground instruction as well as combat flying, firing rockets and missiles, mountain flying and armaments training in South Wales and military exercises on Dartmoor. The helicopter is a Royal Navy Commando Wessex Mark V. This is the Prince's first familiarization flight, beginning 38 hours dual flying before going solo for 15 hours, 
He scheduled to qualify in three and a half months. Stand by for takeoff. The RAF reported the Prince had good hands, but the experts say controlling a helicopter in vertical flight and hovering and manoeuvring in all kinds of weather is a quite different operation from flying a jet plane. In the meantime, other pilots have been warned to keep clear. Rosyth Dockyard and the biggest little ship in the Royal Navy. Bronnington's skipper prepares to take his charge to sea, a short, sharp, limbering up cruise that Prince Charles and his crew take in their stride. As a mine hunter, Bronnington, with 33 others of her class, has a big job to do. No rehearsal is wasted. The fourth bridge, dead ahead. On this cruise, Bronnington's royal commander has an interested guest aboard, his young brother, Prince Andrew. Astern and ready to take part in the exercise, other ships of the first mine countermeasures squadron. Bronnington's active service operation is simple. The location of mines, usually by sonar beam, and their disposal, either by explosion or by neutralizing them for later recovery by the team of divers who always form part of Bronnington's crew. Meanwhile, Bronnington's young boss is on the alert as the exercise develops. Mine hunters are full of surprises. To offset the effect of modern magnetic mines, these little ships are built of double mahogany, top sides of aluminium alloy and other materials that have the lowest magnetic content. When roused, Bronnington can raise 16 knots from two deltic diesels. In the modern Navy, they don't throw lines from ship to ship anymore. Prince Andrew gets a running commentary on what's going on. She's a happy ship and an efficient one, and the exercise is going according to plan. Job well done. It's time for HMS Bronnington and her young skipper to head for home. As if by royal appointment, the weather on the great day is perfect, giving London a touch of summer magic. From Buckingham Palace, a semi-state Landau carries the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh to St. Paul's Cathedral for the wedding of their much-loved son, the Prince of Wales. as the Queen Mother said for all of us, I wouldn't have missed this day for anything. On the steps of St Paul's, it's a scene straight from a Victorian picture book.
enchanting bridesmaids with wreaths of flowers in their hair, and the page boys, straight and slim, in 19th century sailor suits, all under the firm but pretty eye of Lady Sarah Armstrong Jones, the chief bridesmaid. The wedding guests assemble, not just the famous like Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and Mrs. Nancy Reagan, wife of the American president, but personal and family friends as well. Also many of the crowned heads of Europe, quite happy for once to play second fiddle. huge, cheerful crowd that has waited so long and patiently roars and waves its welcome. And now the hero of the hour. Beneath the pomp and titles, a nice, rather nervous young man on the most tender and important journey of his life. Beside him, his brother and chief supporter, Prince Andrew, wondering, perhaps, if he's forgotten the ring. As Prince Charles sets off for the cathedral, his mother arrives to be greeted, as tradition in the city demands, by the Lord Mayor of London. The Queen Mother, escorted by Prince Edward. Around the 1902 State Landau rides a Prince of Wales escort of the Household Cavalry, gleaming and bright. An escort of mounted police wait for Lady Diana at Clarence's house. Though still a commoner, the pretty English girl will be transformed into the third Lady of the Realm, Princess of Wales. In St Paul's, the Queen and other members of the royal family make their way past the other 3,000 wedding guests to take their places. The Duke and Duchess of Kent, the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester, Princess Margaret and Viscount Linley, and Princess Anne with Captain Mark Phillips. The Queen is preceded by the Lord Mayor, bearing the pearl sword presented to the city by Queen Elizabeth I, to commemorate the victory over the Armada in 1588. And so the stage is set. And here is the groom, exactly on time punctuality being the privilege of princes. Prince Charles wears a uniform of Royal Navy Commander, his brother that of midshipman.
passing through Admiralty Arch, the bride is not far behind. At her side, her father, the Earl Spencer. Prince Charles makes his way down the aisle. His supporters, Prince Edward with Prince Andrew, still hoping he hasn't lost the ring. For swearing the usual privilege of brides, Lady Diana arrives on time as well. The whole day is to be a superb example of precision and timing, so typical of British ceremonial. The world gets its first full glimpse of the fairy tale princess, demure behind her veil, and the wedding dress that has been a carefully guarded secret, resplendent ivory silk taffeta trimmed with antique lace and a long, long train, all 25 feet hand embroidered. As bewitching and romantic a bride as ever touched the heart of the world. But that long train is a bridesmaid's nightmare. On her father's arm, Lady Diana Spencer sets off to join the Prince of her heart. and pale gardenias, dark myrtle and golden mount pattern roses. So Charles and Diana come together before God and the world to make their vows, each to the other. The service is to be taken by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Charles Philip Arthur George, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live? I will. Diana Francis, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband, to live together according to God's law in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? I will. Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? I, Charles Philip Arthur George. I, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Diana Francis. Take thee, Diana Francis. To my wedded wife. To my wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto I give thee my troth. 
and there too I give thee my troth. I, Diana Francis. I, Diana Francis. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Philip Charles Arthur George. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto I give thee my troth. And thereto I give thee my troth. There. He hadn't lost the ring after all. With this ring. With this ring. I thee wed. I thee wed. With my body. With my body. I thee honor. I thee honor. And all my worldly goods with thee I share. All thy goods with thee I share. Let us pray. And so the knot is tied. Those whom God has joined together, let no man put asunder. For as much as Charles Philip Arthur George and Diana Francis have consented together in holy wedlock and have witnessed the same before God and this company and thereto have given and pledged their troth either to other and have declared the same by giving and receiving of a ring and by joining of hands, I pronounce that they be man and wife together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Charles and Diana, now man and wife, move up to the high altar for the blessing. God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love. Defend you on every side and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. the Prince and Princess of Wales make their way back down the aisle to the tumultuous welcome awaiting them at the steps of St. Paul's. And so, out into sunshine and bells and wild delight, as a palpable wave of affection and pride wells out from the crowd.
long train makes the state lander look remarkably full. As their families look on, with what emotions in their hearts, the Prince and Princess of Wales begin their first public journey, returning through the packed streets of London to Buckingham Palace. those who say that the monarchy has no relevance to modern British life. Obviously, a lot of people don't agree. Behind the newlyweds comes the Queen, accompanied by the Earl Spencer. The Duke of Edinburgh with the bride's mother, Mrs. Shand Kidd. The Queen Mother with Prince Andrew. Who can doubt the love and happiness that this couple so obviously feel and share? So strong that for one inspiring day, a whole nation can forget its troubles to unite in wishing them well. The bridal carriage draws up at the grand entrance to Buckingham Palace on as grand and happy a day as summer sun looked down on. Lady Sarah straightens out a few last problems with that train. Close behind the bridal couple, the Queen's carriage procession arrives.
procession over, the crowd rushes for the traditional vantage point of the palace railings. Whilst behind a slender police cordon, the mall fills with people like a thermometer fills with mercury. And this is what they're waiting for, an appearance on the balcony of Buckingham Palace which has seen so many royal and national occasions in the past. receives a roar of approval from the crowd who call the couple back and back again onto the balcony. It's hard to argue with half a million people who know what they want. Every single one was rewarded by this tender kiss. At last, photographs taken, wedding breakfast eaten, toast drunk, and after fond farewells, the young couple managed to get away on their honeymoon. A thoroughly unofficial addition to the 1902 state landau, balloons decorated with the Prince of Wales feathers and a notice proclaiming, just married, in case anyone didn't know. It seems that princes of the blood or not, younger brothers are much the same everywhere. Queen Victoria may not have been amused, but everyone else was. It's obvious even trite, to describe this tale of the beautiful maid who marries the handsome prince as a fairy story. It's certainly sentimental to do so, but what's wrong with that? All the best fairy stories end with the words, and they all lived happily ever after. May we pray that this fairy story is no exception. <laughs>